Hello and welcome to the third in the series of Erlang Solutions webinars entitled uh, Learning Erlang, the Advantages of Keeping Things Simple. My name is Mladen Milicic and I'm the Solutions Director here at Erlang Solutions. Today's webinar follows on from the one we had last month, which was dealing with Mongoose IM, our instant messaging platform, and which is available for viewing on our Erlang Solutions web pages. Today's webinar goes into the very heart of what we do as a company completely devoted to the Erlang programming language. Learning Erlang is that key step in every prospective Erlanger's life. Starting from the right foundations can save a lot of time and maximize efficiency of invested effort. And Erlang is all about efficiency and saving time. Uh, it is also a language that is very easy to pick up and start with. This is all why we here at Erlang Solutions place much emphasis on training companies and individuals in Erlang and introducing them to a new and a bigger world. We spare no cost and effort in providing customized Erlang training tailored to needs, interests, and backgrounds of the attendees. And we have been doing so for the past 15 years, getting organizations across the globe to become knowledgeable in Erlang and self-sufficient and confident in their Erlang development and ambitions. When Erlang Solutions were formed as a company, we had the distinct privilege of having people who invented Erlang as a language join our ranks. It is indeed these people who today perform our Erlang accredited training and who traverse the globe in spreading Erlang skills and knowledge. Today's webinar will tell you all you need to know about getting started with learning Erlang and what makes Erlang so simple to pick up and to begin with. As with any live events, please excuse any technical issues we may encounter today. To start by telling you a bit about Erlang Solutions, we are a products and services oriented company completely devoted to Erlang. Since our founding in 1998, we have worked with organizations and individuals using Erlang, helping evolve the language, and supporting people and businesses using it. Today, we have about 70 people across our offices in London, Stockholm, Krakow, and Budapest, and working on projects across the globe. We fly the Erlang flag and are keen on creating value and competitive advantage for our customers across industries and uh, through the unique features and characteristics of Erlang as a language. We are ambitious in development of Erlang-based products and we work to create lasting partnerships with our customers. In terms of today, we thought long and hard about our speakers uh, for the webinar and have opted for two people who are second to none in terms of providing an introduction to why and how to learn Erlang. I'm very glad to say that today we have with us the Erlang Solutions Product Development Manager, Torben Hoffman, a self-confessed priest of Erlang who has taken his ministry to a whole new level in driving Erlang Solutions' product creation. Torben has many years of practical Erlang experience across industries and has spent uh, a number of them supporting the spreading of Erlang and the strengthening of the Erlang community. We are all also deeply privileged to have with us uh, Robert Verding. Robert is, of course, one of the inventors of Erlang from the early days of the language at Ericsson Labs and today uses his time to spearhead our research efforts and also travels the globe and performs Erlang training for our customers across the world. I'm sure you will all agree that there is no better way to learn Erlang than from the person who created it. Should you or your organization be inspired by the talk today and wish to arrange a tailored training session performed on your site, you might be lucky enough to have Robert Verding delivering the training. Please allow me to finish by saying you are welcome to post questions throughout the duration of the webinar by using the chat facility. Our speakers, Torben and Robert, will answer as many questions as time allows at the end of the webinar. If any questions do go unanswered, you are welcome to raise them via email using the following address, uh, webinar at erlang-solutions.com. That's webinar at erlang-solutions.com. If you are interested in learning more about Erlang training, or if you wish to establish whether it may be a solution for the challenges your own business may be facing, please feel free to use the same email address or email me directly using my email details, which will be shared at the end of uh, the presentations. The same goes for any other questions you may have. Feel free to contact us. I would now like to hand over to Torben Hoffman, who will be glad to start us off. Yeah, thank you, Laden, for the kind words. Uh, I will give you uh, an overview of the key features of Erlang today. 
and also a bit of background so you can get an idea of where Erlang is at the right fit and how you can go about deciding if you should be using Erlang for a particular problem. So we'll start with a bit of history um, and also a bit of how things are when you're developing software. Um, it started. This started back in, in the 80s where Ericsson had an enormous pressure on getting their products uh, to market a lot faster. I don't think that's the same pressure we're all feeling today, getting things out there in a product quality that lasts um, uh, fast is, is a huge pressure. Then there's also the, uh, the ever challenging uh, thing about utilization of whatever cube computing resources you have available. Then there's also the fortunate, or you could say a rich man's problem is that when you have a success, you need to be able to scale it and not have your software break down on you when you end up having millions of users uh, using your software. And then at the end of it, you also have to, in the long run, maintain your software, and that also turns into a burden. Ericsson saw this in the 80s, and the realities of software development hasn't changed much since. So how did they go about it, Ericsson? Well, they started out by saying uh, a number of things about um, what they needed. But what we will just have a short intermission here and say what could be, and this is the promise of Erlang. What if you could finish up three to four times faster than your competition? So you'd be the happy man on this picture. What if you had software that could just magically scale on the number of cores in your machine and also the number of machines you throw at your problem without having to rewrite the code? And what if you could avoid having huge stacks of code, but just a smaller stack of code that's more readable and understandable? And if you could have all of these, that equates money. And that's what we're all here for, to learn how to make money. And the future is actually here, and the future is Erlang, and it's got some 20 years in the making. Um, yeah. Now, Ericsson started out by, by posting a number of requirements for Erlang not to be a general purpose language, to, but to solve the specific needs uh, of, uh, they had for telecom. So they wanted large scale concurrency. So this is about having tens or hundreds of thousands of processes ongoing uh, in, a, um, in a system at one time. This or, orinate, originates in the um, needs they had for telecom where you have a number of uh, ongoing conversations in the telephone central. And these things, given that they are related to um, audio, you have some soft real-time requirements on it uh, because they need to respond relatively fast uh, in order to have a reasonable performance these systems. And then these, they also had to be distributed because you couldn't really live with the fact of having a system that was just one node, no, uh, one machine. It would, that would be too small to solve your problem. So you needed to distribute the application uh, over a number of machines, also for the sake of, of redundancies. Then you needed to interact with hardware, because not all things can be handled in wonderful software. Sometimes you need to get closer to the metal, and that's why you need to be able to interact with hardware. You also had to, to provide quite large software systems, because they had a lot of features in them. And a lot of those features were actually quite complex. Um, and anybody that has seen the, the code or most or the feature sets on most telephone switches will testify that that's a complex uh, system. Um, and then they had to have the things up and running for many years uh, without going down. And at the same notice uh, or related to this, they also needed to be able to have software maintenance on the fly um, so that they could keep their telephone switches running because if they weren't running, Ericsson wasn't being paid. They were being paid for uptime. And then they also needed high quality and reliability because, well, people tend to think of a phone as something that just has to work when you're trying to make a phone call. And then they also had to have fault tolerance uh, in the mix. And if you look at that, it, it sounds familiar. I think many of you would have been faced by requirements to one of your projects you, you've been working on that could tick off a number of these uh, requirements. And the thing is, it also sounds good. What if you could have something that helps you get all these things with a little more ease than what you have to do today? And this is what Erlang is about. And then the trick here is that you need to, to separate the notions between having something that's uh, uh, general purpose programming language and something that's domain specific. So in here, we have the domain of telecom. In order to meet the needs of telecom, you need to fill out this um, 
uh, ellipses. And uh, what they had back then, they Ericsson mostly looked at, at C as the starting point, but today you'd have C++ and Java as your starting point for many of these things. And then there's the entire gap you need to fill between what the language provides and what you need to do in your domain. That's the work you need to do. And the bigger the gap, the more work you need to do. And the way Ericsson then created it was that they added Erlang, which fills out a lot more of the requirements of the telecom domain. And then there's a smaller gap here, and that smaller gap actually equals a lot of benefit. You need to write far, far less code, there's less code to maintain, and I've written it in a nice way here, smaller gaps, so a smaller gap equals benefit, but actually this equals money. You save money in the both in development and also in doing it. Now, how do you go about doing that? Yeah, well, you make sure you have a focus. And the focus uh, for, for Erlang is that it focuses on the coordination, the middleware, the control part of systems, not about the graphical user interfaces. It knows how to interact with graphical user interfaces, but it's not good for writing it. It also knows how to interact with drivers, but it's not good at writing them. So the sweet spot, middleware, coordination, control. So if you have a system or problem where middleware, coordination, control, those words come up, Erlang might be a good fit. And then if you look at it uh, this way, we take the dimension I just mentioned before, and you can see how you can go and mix and match to get the right solution for your problem. So telecom has a high need for drivers because there's a lot of hardware you need to interact with. It also has a high need for coordination due to the fact that there's a lot of things going on in the telecom system. And the need for, for GUI things are, is not that great. You, you can patch other systems on for that. Well, the Ericsson saw in the beginning there that they had C, which is phenomenal for doing drivers. Not so good for doing coordination, a bit better for doing user interfaces because there's a lot of libraries you can interact with, so you can get by on that. So what they did, they created Erlang in this way. So Erlang actually, I would say, sucks at doing drivers, but excels at coordination, and it's not that good for, for GUIs uh, there. And then when you go and tackle the problem with the combination of, of, of C and Erlang for telecom, you have a, a perfect match because you have the best language in the world to write drivers in, that's C, and you've got the be best language in the world to handle coordination, and that's Erlang, and together they can rule the world here. Another thing here to notice is that Erlang is very good, uh, has good libraries for interacting with other things, for instance C, but other, other things. So you could take in and have a system that's written in Erlang and Haskell, Erlang and Ruby, and you name it, and you can integrate them and use one the one tool for what it's good at and the other tool for what that, that's good at. Now, so it would be a short story if this was only about uh, telecom, but the, the 10 requirements you saw before, we all we can re recognize those as being generic requirements, and that actually means that there's a number of, of domains where Erlang can be used in. So we have things like uh, messaging systems, uh, EJAVAD, this uh, XLPP server, and also our own Erlang Solutions own Mongoose IM uh, fork of EJAVAD that adds a few more features, is OTP compliant and things like that. And then you go on to have things like web servers. You have yours, which has a lot of years behind it, very solid, Chicago Post, Cowboy. You can also go into the area of payment switches and soft switches, where we've done a lot of work with Vocalink, uh, and we've created our own uh, soft switch for OpenFlow called Link. Uh, and you can read more about that on our web page. Then Erlang also has found uh, use in distributed databases, React, CouchDB, Scalaris, and actually CouchDB has a success story behind it, where the scalability you get from Erlang was inherited by CouchDB and allowed the makers of Draw Something to scale to enormous heights and make a ton of money. And that's what we all want to do, to make a ton of money and have fun in the meantime. And then it's also been used in queuing systems. Uh, RapidMQ is a famous product. It's implementing the AMQP model. The entire backend is written in Erlang. So you can see there's a device, a, a diverse range of uh, domains where Erlang fits because the general requirements actually fits a lot of uh, uh, domains today. Now, now I'll come into and explain a few things, a few features of Erlang that makes it so ideal. Uh, for having a high productivity. And one of this, this is the notion of when to share and not to share uh, memory. Um, Erlang actually operates on a, a it's a process-oriented uh, language which has processes communicating by message passing. In all systems, 
we have memory and you have processes accessing this memory. I've seen that. I have a legacy in telecom. This is how you build those systems. You have a number of processes or threads or whatever you call it in the language you're doing it in. Uh, and they are manipulating the same memory. The problem arises when process one dies uh, there, it corrupts the memory. What is what are you to do with the other processes that access the same memory? There's actually only one same thing you can do, and that is to kill that process off and start all over again. That's not optimal, and that's why Erlang has a share nothing model where each process has its own memory space. You can only exchange messages between the processes by sending messages. Uh, from one process to the other. And in this case, you'll see that if process one dies, it still corrupts the memory it had. But then Erlang runs with a runtime system that has a garbage collect. It'll come around, it'll garbage collect the corrupted memory, but process two lives happily without knowing anything uh, that process one has died. So that's, this is a happy scenario compared to the old one where you had to kill off all processes. Then Another thing that's built into this was the last item on the generic list about failures. We would, should remember Murphy's law here that anything that can go wrong will go wrong. And the way uh, you see that when you're doing big systems is that you can have programming errors. We're all humans, so this is to be expected. Then you can also have disk failures, which is a bit nasty, and all the sorts of uh, hardware failures. And then you can have network failures, which is also quite irritating, but it's things they can happen. And in normal pro most normal pro uh, programming paradigms, they are fault intolerant, meaning that you need to deal with the error when it happens, or at some other point if you have, um, you're throwing exceptions around, but you need to handle that error or you, you will have to die, your system will have to go down. Now, Erlang is, this, is fault tolerant by design, and that actually means that failures are embraced and managed. And that may sound quite weird when you're looking at it from the first time, but it's, it's actually a sane stance to take when you're looking at systems. You know systems will have failures, so it's better to have a technology like Erlang that helps you deal with the failures than trying to be intolerant to them and write a ton of defensive code. And this actually then turns into money. This is not just a, an academic feature. This is about money. And, and we'll see that in a few seconds. But the way you do it in Erlang, here you have a, a, a piece of Erlang code that takes a, a day of the week and turns it into the number of that day in the week. And here you have it, the full-blown thing, where you actually have a catch-all clause at the end saying that if it's not one of the days of the week, then we throw a return an error on known day as the value instead of a number. But in Erlang, we burn that code. That is not code we need to see. We will let it fail. The caller of this function, if he calls it with something that is not one of the weekdays we know, he should fail because in this case, uh, he'll get a case clause uh, not uh, matching and uh, then he'll have to deal with that error. And th that comes from the notion that error actually encourages uh, you to be aggressive or offensive uh, in your programming style go for the happy day scenario and let somebody else deal with the errors. And we'll get to that or somebody else uh, in, in a few seconds. But this has, as I said, an enormous effect on uh, the amount of money you make on this. And how is that? Well, here's a study done by Motorola Labs in uh, collaboration with uh, Jan Henry Newstrom. And he went in and he took a C application, and then he rewrote it in Erlang. You don't have to look at all the details of this thing, but the thing to know, notice here, the code that actually solves the problem, the problem of, of your customer, what you're being paid to solve. This is the app code here. For the C and the C library, you have something like 18 to 12% of the code going into solving the problem. The rest of the code is all sorts of mumbo jumbo uh, you need to do to make uh, meet the requirements, the full requirements, um, uh, in the system. You have a lot of defensive code, uh, around 25%. Now for Erlang, you end up having 60, over 60% 60 of your code is actually dedicated to solving the problem of your customer. This is money in the bank right here. So you have at least a free x productivity when it comes to um, addressing the needs of your customer. And I've also done studies while I worked uh, for Motorola, and it shows that it actually takes the same amount of time to write 
uh, a line of Erlang code as it does to write a, a line of C code. So the fact you have uh, fewer lines of code in Erlang and more of it is, is devoted to solving the problem actually means you're making money. Now, we all floated all this thing about saying we should let it fail. The only way you can, can, can deal with having a system where you can have processes that, that fails and it's part of, of everyday nature, and you need to be able to deal with these failures. So you have one here, you have two ways of, of, of doing this. Either you link two processes together, that means for P1 and P2 in the top part. If one of them dies, the other one will die with it. And if you need that, that's part of what uh, depends on what you, you're trying to solve. In another case, you can also have a monitor thing where P1 here is monitoring P2, so if P2 dies, P1 will be notified, but he will not die from it. He will take a decision based on, okay, P2 is, is gone, let me deal with that failure. And this is key to making a, a fault-tolerant system is, you find ways to link errors up and you have somebody standing on the side fixing the problems. And that, those things are in Erlang what we call supervisors. Supervisors have basically one task uh, to do is to start and monitor worker processes. So when in your system you'd have a, a tree of things where the workers are the ones doing the work uh, of your application and you have supervisors that are just sitting there watching out if the workers they started, if they're still happy and if they die they take a decision um, on what to do. In some cases, you need to kill off an entire tree and restart it. In other cases, you just restart the worker. And Robert uh, Verding will later on explain more about how this works in the OTP library, because that's built on this principle. But this is the core functionality of Erlang. And this is a key point uh, to understand if you want to make use of Erlang, that you have this notion of workers that are supervised. Now, the benefit you get from, from, from sharing nothing is that you end up having that um, even you have if you add more cores to your machines you can actually have processes running of each of these cores there's nothing matching in that uh, but the magic is uh, to a certain thing if you call it magic is that you have a scheduler running on each core and it's the runtime system then coordinates between the schedulers and have processes distributed amongst the cores and have the word distributed so you get a speed up when you add more cores uh, without having to rewrite your code. All of this is of course limited to the amount of parallelism that is in your program, but you don't have to rewrite your program to make use of more cores. You might have to rewrite something if you're not having a problem that's not parallelized enough, but that's a different issue. This is something you won't find in many other languages. In Erlang you get it for free due to the fact you have share nothing, message passing between processes, and that actually enables you to do this. And that also works over machines. And the way Erlang operates with having a system that runs on different machines is every time you have a machine you can run an instance of the Erlang runtime system and we call that a node in Erlang lingo. Then if you add another machine and run the runtime system of that, you connect the two nodes using a TCP connection. And then you will have a system and when you're programming that and you're communicating there, you can't tell the difference if the one process you're talking to, if that's on your local machine or it's on the other machine at the other end of the world. And th this then extends by adding another node, then you hook them all up, fully meshed here, and then you continue on and you end up having a fully connected graph between all the nodes and it's totally transparent to the, to, to the programs, again, where the, the processes that are doing the work are located. And that allows you to scale over machines. Now, staying alive. You have to learn some new moves to stay alive. In the early 70s, you have guys, had guys like David Bowie with the punk rock and everything. Then it turned into disco. Some call it the dark ages. I don't know. And then it turned into Michael Jackson. In all cases, those people that were controlling and mastering the dance floors of the time, they were faced with a challenge every time you had this disruption. You can think of this as a disruption in, in what you have to, to be able to do, the requirements to you change. And most, in most cases and in most systems, you either have to stop dancing or you have to have a total restart and learn everything. And those things are not nice. And the way this is handled then in Erlang is quite different. There's a staying alive Erlang style. There's no Erlang dance like there's a Gangnam style dance yet, but maybe we can get up, uh, get up to the point someday. Now what do you do in Erlang? You have a process. It's running version one of your code. Now, 
instead of having a total uh, stop of your system and take some time to learn the new moves, what you do is you load into the runtime system version 2 of the code for the same process. Then when you want to change some version 1 to version 2, you send a code change signal to the process and it actually starts running version 2 of uh, the code. And that this is how uh, uh, Ericsson managed to, with some of the switches, to uh, get nine nines of uptime in the systems because they didn't have to take down the systems to upgrade the systems uh, there. It's a quite uh, powerful uh, feature. And that concludes my part of this. And now I'll leave the word to Robert Wording, who will take you through OTP and what it is and what, why it's good for you. Thank you. Um, hi, this is Robert Birding. Yes, so I want to talk a bit about OTP. And, well, wherefore art thou OTP? Why OTP? Uh, let's see. Yes, now it goes. Yes, the question is why should I learn and use OTP? As Torben explained, Erlang itself has a lot of nice features, so why, go, why, why not just settle for those? And, well, one simple reason, of course, is I should use it for the same reasons most, if not all, production systems that are running Erlang use OTP. I honestly don't know of any product which is, doesn't, is not based on OTP. Well, the question then becomes, of course, why do most or all production systems use OTP, not just using the bare Erlang? This boils down to what you need to do, what you need when you're building a system. So when you're building a system, you need libraries. Unless you're writing an extremely trivial application, you will find very quickly that there's an awful lot of code that needs to be written, an awful lot of libraries that, that are very useful if they exist. So you, you need libraries doing all this. You can, of course, do it yourself. There's nothing stopping you. It's just often a lot of wasted time. What is also very important is you need a set of design principles and patterns for building your st and structuring your system. How, how am I going to put my system together? How am I going to get the, how, what structures am I going to use? How am I going to make everything fit together nicely? These are the type of, these design principles, these patterns, these, you need those from the beginning when you're, when you're actually doing the initial structures of your system to build this. You need a methodology for building things and putting things together. You also, well, you don't need, but it's also extremely nice to have a set of tools that help you uh, when you're developing your system. Tools for checking your system, tools um, for doing testing, runtime analysis, and all these type of things, you need these tools for doing it. And what's also very important that all these things fit together so that the libraries that you're using actually fit in with the same design principles and design patterns that the rest of the system is built on. So you don't get conflicts in those. That the tools work together with everything like this, so you can make full use of it. Now that all these exist in OTP. And OTP was designed to tackle these issues in a way that makes good use of Erlang's features. So OTP is specifically designed to fit on top of Erlang and use Erlang's features in the best way. It's all written in Erlang, but that is the reason why OTP is what it is. OTP, it stands for the Open Telecom Platform. But there is nothing to, work, to be worried about. You should not be misled by the name or scared off by the name, as some people have been. It is a completely generic middleware. And if you look inside it, you'll find there's actually nothing about telecom in it. We were developing a telecoms uh, company, and there was a very nice name for it. But there's nothing about telecoms in it. Unless, perhaps, the goal of building massively concurrent, reliable, fault tolerant and distributed systems. Those are the properties that are in OTP. Those are the, those are the fundamental properties that OTP was designed to be able to handle, which are the same as Brown. That's really the only telecom part that's in, that's, in the, um, that's in OTP. As I said, it's based on a set of design principles. Uh, it's in different layers here. So at the top level, we have releases, 
Releases are made of a number of applications, and at the bottom level we have something called behaviors. And I'll just, just mention these briefly, what these are. So a release is a complete Erlang system containing, well, it contains the Erlang runtime system, ERTS here, the, the, um, the actual virtual machine. It contains a large number of, of, of applications, OTP applications. Both those provided by the OTP system and those that are user defined. It also contains a number of rules for starting, stopping, and managing the system when it's running. You can define what's going to happen. How does the system is the system supposed to be started? How am I supposed to stop the system in a clean way and manage it? And including in the managing is how am I can I handle up and down rates of the system while the system is running? So I can, t I can define all these things when I'm building my release and use that. So for example, if I have a release running and I have come with an upgrade release, that will contain information on how this upgrade is supposed to be done and how it can be done while the system is actually still online and being used. The next layer is the application. And it's, well, the name is a slight misnomer. It's not, not, not quite the same thing as you would normally expect it, um, when you hear the word application. I would say it's more a component. And it's one logical unit grouped together. It contains, well, it contains Allen code, the modules for building the Allen part of the system. It can contain static data, which, the, which this application, this, this unit needs to run. Um, this unit, or this application might actually be running, need code running in other languages as well, like C or whatever, or Java. And this code will also be part of that application. So the whole application is one unit here. That's the static part of it. And at runtime, it will also contain information about which processes are to run when this application is loaded and started. How is, it, how is the process to run what they're supposed to do? The applications, you can, as I said, you can view them as components. So your system would contain a lot of applications. For example, if you're accessing a database, your database access system, part of the system to access the database would most likely be an application for that. You could have applications for interfacing other languages interfacing other parts of the system. So you, you tend to split your system up into a number of applications, which are units, and they are interacting with each other, working together for the whole system. At the bottom layer, what well, can say this in OTP, uh, we have the concept of a, of a behavior. And a behavior is, is a formalization of a design pattern. So you have a certain design pattern. A behavior is that code in OTP which implements that design pattern. And the basic idea behind the behavior is you try and abstract out the common generic code of the design pattern. You want, to, you want to extract that, you want to bunch that together, that you put that together in one unit, and that is the behavior. This also provides a well-defined user interface to the specific code for, for each usage each instance of the behavior. So you, you know exactly what's going to happen, you know which functions you need to define, you know, you know exactly when they're going to be called and what they're expected to do. The behaviors also provide a lot of built-in functionality which is there if you need it or if you want to use it. For example, there are logging facilities baked into the behavior, there's tracing. The basic um, support needed for doing proper or easily, not quite so difficult code upgrading are also in the behavior. So this is all there, it's all well defined exactly when things work and how things work as well too. So the basic principle behind the behavior is you try and split the code necessary into two parts. There is a generic part, it's called well, generic behavior, and these are, the, these are the parts that are provided by the OTP as library modules. And there is a specific part, which of course is, is, is what's specific for what, what every, every use of that behavior is. It's a callback module here, as provided by the programmer or the user. Now the generic part, of course, it is generic, it's common, it will be used by all instances of that behavior. They'll be using the same code, you just have to supply um, the specifics, specifics for your use. This means that a large portion of the code you'll be running is, will be generic, it's common, it comes with the OTP system, it is extremely well tested. Um, OTP contains actually very few bugs, so the system is very well run. 
this is the basis of what, what Torval was talking about, the nine nines reliability. It was using OTP at the bottom and using this concept for doing it. Um, yeah. There are, well, a number, of, well, there are five predefined behaviors that come with OTP. Um, there's a gen server, which provides a client server pattern. There's the gen FSM, which provides a finite state machine pattern. And there's a gen event, which is something called event manager event handlers. There are a number of events, well, events will occur in the system, and these will be sent to an event manager. And they, they, this manager can have a number of handlers that decide what to do when this event arrives. This, this is also a um, behavior. The supervision tree pattern that Torben mentioned, that is done with the supervisor behavior. So this is the behavior that does that. This is the one that, that actually manages the supervision trees and things like this. And the application itself is a behavior. So it encapsulates the application pattern, and it, it is what you, it, it um, is used when you want to start the application and manage the application. It is done through this behavior. So, well, the, sorry, the first three behaviors, the gen server, the gen FSM, and gen event, they are worker behaviors. They're for the worker processes that do, that do the work. Um, depending, you can choose which one, depending what, which best fits what you need. The supervisor behavior, that is the basis for building the supervision trees. And the, the, the reason you have a supervision tree is that in your system, if you want it to be uh, long-lived, there are a number of services that always must exist, always must be running. Whatever happens in the system, they always must be available. And you use, you tend to use supervisors to ensure this. So um, a supervisor, it has a number of child processes, which can be worker processes, or they can be other supervisor processes. Using nested supervisors, you build something which is called a supervision tree. Now, supervisors, they monitor their children. That is their sole job to do. And when a child dies, they restart that child. Depending on which rules they have, which they have when they've been set up on how to manage their children. So sometimes if a child dies normally, that's perfectly okay. It's done its job, it should now go away. But maybe if it crashes, it should be restarted. Well, sometimes if a child crashes, it is not enough to to just restart that child, you may have to kill off all the children and restart them. They might be interacting in such a way that it's not, it's not acceptable to that one of them just to die. But the behavior system or OPTP is, OT, is open ended in that it is perfectly possible to define new behaviors. If you need a behavior which is not one of these five predefined ones, you can define your own behavior. You can implement processes which fit together with the rest of OTP. I might just need a one-off process which does something special which, which one of the behaviors can't give me. I can write that process and using OTP, using following the rules, I can make a process that will fit in with the rest of OTP. It can be managed perfectly well in the supervision tree and everything like this. So all the tools are there for doing this. So uh, um, OTP is a completely open-ended system. You have your five behaviors when you start off, but you can add more when necessary. So it's not closed in that sense at all. So that is some of the reasons why you would use, or most, or, most, or not all, uh, products actually use OTP to base on. It allows you, uh, gives you a lot of extra functionality, a lot of reliability, and it, it allows you to add things when you need. It allows you to mix with things that aren't written in OTP as well too. That was just, a quick version of uh, well, a quick description of OTP and some of the benefits of using OTP. So yes, the, I'm my part. I'll hand back to Maladen, and if you um, want more information, please contact him. Unmuted. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Uh, okay, well, thank you for that, uh, Mobbit and Torben. Mobbit and Torben. Um, what I think would be interesting now is to answer uh, some of the questions that we've been receiving uh, during the webinar. Uh, and I guess I can start uh, and read out a couple of these. Um, let me just have a quick look at the list of questions that we've, uh, that we've had. Okay, here's one uh, that's interesting. Uh, I think this might be something that both 
uh, Torben and Robert can answer. Uh, the question is effectively on the topic of the child processes that uh, both Torben and Robert have addressed. And effectively refers to the situation where a child process has failed, uh, the supervisor has restarted it, and then the issue is what happens if the supervisor process just keeps restarting the child process without actually dealing with the issue that caused the crash in the first place. Uh, gentlemen, if you uh, just want to pick that up and answer, that would be great. Um, yeah, well, I, I, I could say one of the things, one of the rules you can program into a supervisor is um, is how long it, or how often it is, it is going to allow to restart something. So if you get this case where it restarts a worker, the worker dies, it restarts a worker again, it dies, etc., you can say how often is it, allowed, is it going to do that. And if that limit is reached, then the supervisor decides, I am giving up. I can't work with this anymore, I give up, I will die myself, and I'll just pass the buck up to the, to the next level about that to decide what to do, whether it is to restart me to try again or whatever that might be. And that, that's, that's the built-in way of um, handling this problem. I think that's about, that's about all I can say think about that at the moment. I mean, um, you still have the problem of working out what actually went wrong, and um, you will most naturally have been logging the system so you can actually see what errors go on and you can go in and fix the system. Um, one thing I haven't mentioned with this, I think Torben went mentioned a bit about doing code upgrades. Uh, these type of things working with the system you can do while the system is actually running as well too. So you don't have to take the system down to fix it. Okay, thank you Robert. Um, one other question that has arrived and uh, that seems quite interesting is uh, what is the current limit of uh, multi-core scalability of Erlang? Yeah, so that would be on, on how many cores would you be able to utilize the Erlang runtime system. And um, currently, uh, provided you come with an application that has that level of parallelism in it, then you can utilize uh, 60 cores before you run into uh, performance hits. Um, and that's actually something where Erlang Solutions is involved in a number of EU projects that are trying to address and take this limit uh, even higher um, there. So we're trying to move that limit, but right now you can utilize 60 cores. And uh, I don't know how many of you guys at home that has a 60 core machine. I don't. Um, but at least that's what you can do if you have a very powerful machine. Okay, here's another question that uh, both uh, you, Torben, and uh, Robert might wish to answer. The question is, um, effectively, Erlang started within the telecommunications sector, obviously being uh, sort of created by Ericsson within Ericsson Labs. Uh, now, would you say that Erlang has spread as actively uh, to other sectors? And if you can give a couple of examples of applications outside of telecoms. Yeah, I I think I listed listed a few uh, when I talked, and uh, I can say, for instance, if, if we take the notion of React, which is a NoSQL uh, database, uh, distributed uh, one, uh, that there the all the things that are so good about uh, the core requirements uh, coming from the telecom actually rings in here. You need to be fault tolerant if you're dealing with a distributed database. You need to have a massive amount of concurrency if you have a lot of uh, people accessing your data, and that, that's what you have in those systems. So that it has uh, sped quite well, and uh, the legacy of telecom also shines in, in, uh, in, in Rabbit and Cube because one of the things you need to deal with on a daily basis in telecom systems are protocols. And AMQP is a very well-defined protocol, and it's like running a, a hot knife through hot butter. To, to use Erlang for, for AMQP, and that's what the, the people that did uh, Rabbit and Cube. Uh, did so, so it, it has that uh, ability to spread when the problem is right. So, so you, you need to have a keep in mind if you have a coordination problem, Erlang might be your friend. If you have a hardcore CPU intensive computation, you are probably better off going somewhere else because uh, Erlang is, is, is designed for, 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 for low latency and not for high throughput uh, for these things, and also not for, for really going to the metal. And, and getting the max out of your computer. So it's a coordination language, and that's also why it, it's, as I said, it's a domain-specific thing um, that has a certain domain or, or range of problems it's very good for, 
and then it, it outsources uh, to other programming languages uh, things like dealing with drivers or a hardcore parallel computation uh, that's sped off done in C. So, so that's the kind of flexibility you get with Erlang. Does Thank you for that, that answers the question. Uh, I think it does. Uh, can I, if I can just add one thing, um, mm -hmm. it's actually, well, it types of, it's actually being used more outside of Ericsson in the telecoms branch than inside at the moment. Um, things where you, need, where, you, where you want to handle a large number of connections, for example, suit Erlang very well. Um, it's being used in the gaming world, the back end for those reasons, that it's very easy to set up a system which can handle a large number of communications and it uses quite few resources to do that compared to other, to other systems. So if you want hundreds of thousands of connections, parallel connections, Erlang is, is a very good choice for that. So yes, Thank just, you, just, a, just a quick comment. Thank you, Robert. Um, there's another interesting question that touches upon the heart of the topic of learning Erlang. Erlang is obviously, you know, the community of Erlangers is a growing community. And the question specifically says, uh, if you have not used Erlang previously, but you are using Erlang-based solutions as sort of black boxes that give you performance, scalability, and so on, do you actually have to learn Erlang? Or are you able to sort of hook in using your existing tools and, you know, happily coexist with a black box whilst using your current tools? Uh, I, I think I, we can speak to that from, from the standpoint of the example of uh, RapidMQ. Um, uh, let's, let's take it from that standpoint that you can actually use RapidMQ for years without having to learn yourself one line of uh, Erlang because you can interact with it from a number of different um, uh, languages. Um, so, so that's absolutely doable and you can do the same thing with React. Actually, you can interact with it from a number of different uh, languages and get the magic uh, of that. That said, then for instance, for RabbitMQ, sometimes you want to take the system a bit further than what it was originally designed for because having a, a queuing system that originally created for banks like AMQP might not be the perfect fit for whatever queuing system you have in mind. And in those situations, you need to go a little bit under, under the hood and look at the engine and do something. But you can live happily for a very long time with these systems without knowing Erlang. But then again, I would say that it would be a great pity not to learn Erlang. It's been one of the biggest joys of my life. So that's a lot of fun you're cutting yourself out from. But on the business-wise, you can live happily for a number of years. Absolutely. Well, uh, thanks for that, Torben. Uh, one very pragmatic question that has arrived is, uh, one that I can uh, provide an answer to, and that is what kinds of training do we have uh, currently? Well, I'm glad to say, as I mentioned briefly in the introduction, uh, we effectively offer tailored customized courses, uh, Erlang training courses that are performed on your organization's site. So effectively, that means that uh, you can choose between a beginning uh, or a beginner's level course or an introductory level course of Erlang and an advanced level course. Both courses uh, last for five working days, which basically means throughout the working week. Uh, one of the courses is, in, is entitled Erlang by Example, which is the introductory level, level course. The other course is called Erlang OTP, and we've talked about OTP during the presentations. The courses we always tailor very specifically towards your organization, towards your specific needs and requirements, towards the attendees themselves. So the people attending the course, their backgrounds and unique interests. And this is where the sort of uh, power of learning really comes through. And finally, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, we have some remarkable people actually performing the training courses. So, so Robert Verding, for example, is one of our leading uh, sort of individuals going around the world and uh, training people across organizations and industries in our life. So if you are interested in um, organizing the course within your organization, then feel free to uh, drop me a mail or drop us a mail and we will uh, be happy to sort of discuss your specific requirements and uh, make that happen. Okay, one, uh, sorry, one additional question that has come in uh, as we speak is uh, how easy is to integrate Erlang with other languages? In other words, how open is Erlang to that connection? 
You well, go first, very. Robert. <laughs> <laughs> you, you go ahead. You go ahead. I think. No, no, I, I touched a bit upon it because uh, Ericsson created Erlang in in a space where it needed to fit in with other technologies. So Erlang is actually, as Robert started saying, very easy to integrate with uh, other languages. It, it has a um, binary term format that's very easy to decode. So it's very easy to set up a, a, a communication path between an Erlang uh, process and something that's written in some, some other language. Uh, the, the biggest library around and that, that ships with OTP is, is, is focusing on C. But there are also libraries out there for integrating with Python uh, and Ruby. And uh, so you can mix these things in uh, quite nicely. And, and one of the research things we are looking at right now at Erlang Solutions is how to integrate with OpenCL and find ways to uh, get the benefits of, of running code on your GPU, uh, which is normally quite parallelized uh, computer intensive code, and then have the coordination still handled in Erlang. I think you, can you add to that, Robert? Yeah, yeah. I mean, as you say, I mean, Erlang was designed to talk to other systems from the very beginning. Initially, it was um, telephony hardware. Um, I think almost all applications that have been run, built, products were built in, in Ericsson. Erlang has been the controlling a lot at the control and logic level, and there have been things written in either specialized hardware or in C for doing the low-level um, data transfers. So this um, this split between Erlang and Erlang use other things has been in from the very beginning. Um, and there are a number of mechanisms built into the system at the low level which allow, gives you different ways of talking with, with the outside world, with, it, with other languages, other systems. And there are a number of specialized things built on top. So for example, there's something called there's an application called J interface for talking with Java. And okay. you can you may talk about anything. Right? Sure. Thanks for that, Robert. Uh, another question from uh, a person uh, who is clearly a prospective uh, Erlanger. Uh, Vivek is asking, uh, how long does it actually take, you know, in your view, to become proficient in Erlang, and in particular proficient in OTP? Um, okay, it's a bit hard to give it. It depends a bit on your background. Um, Erlang is a functional language, and that can take well, if say a few days getting used to the style of doing it, of how you how you program in these things, um, the very um, explicit and deep rooted concurrence in the Erlang means a different way of, of of how you structure your problem or your solution to a problem, which can take a bit of getting used to. OTP is is very in many ways very straightforward. Once you've just mastered it programming, writing code in Erlang, going to OTP, I think anyway, is quite a small step. The fundamental design patterns behind OTP are rather basic and very, just, I think, easy to, easy to understand. Um, then, of course, you just need practice. So, I, I mean, a week or two, that's perfectly well for, that's perfectly well for knowing mo learning most of the language and most of OTP and even building systems in OTP. Then, of course, as I say, you need practice. I know you. you I think I'm talking in one sense give a better, yeah, well, better reply to that. Yeah, well, I, I lived in an organization that were much, very much into performance and um, or productivity rather, not performance in the source, but productivity. And uh, I measured up that at the end of the project, which included the learning curve for Erlang, after uh, after four years where we included everything, and this was everything from the system requirements all the way down to system tests. And also have six acceptances by customers. All the effort that went into this, then Erlang comes out as three times as uh, productive as um, C, C, uh, C plus plus and Java, and and five to six times as productive uh, as C. Um, and then you can say, when 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 is the crossing point? Um, and as Robert says, it depends on on your background. If you are a uh, imperative programmer or a guy that has worked predominantly with OO things, I would say that. Um, it takes you about two to three months to reach the same productivity you had before and by doing and then doing it in Erlang. And from that point on, your curve just goes up and up and up because it, you are more productive in Erlang if you have the right fit between the tool and, and the problem at hand. And this learning curve is then faster uh, if you have functional programming background 
or you have some sort of uh, background in uh, process algebras, as it, so that's meaning the more uh, theoretical computer science. Those kind of things will boost your learning. But I would say in two to three times, a good programmer uh, will be more as productive as he was uh, in the old days using C++ or Java. Uh, and, he, in, in and then from that day on, you have a happy man that is just seeing his productivity <laughs> raise day by day. <laughs> Okay, we, we have an interesting question that has just come, and uh, we must make this the last question, uh, uh, sadly, as we've sort of run out of time. But um, the question is, effectively, how would you compare Erlang with, and what are the benefits of Erlang compared with uh, tools such as Scala and uh, Akka? So this is on the topic of using the right tool for the job, and obviously, uh, you know, seeing what, what the unique benefits of Erlang are in comparison to these two tools? I, I can just say one thing here, that ACCA um, is very much a copy of, of OTP. Uh, they, they, don't, they don't hide it themselves. They're quite, old, they're quite open about this and saying that they pick the, the, many of the ideas, the designs in, in ACCA have been taken from OTP. Um, yeah, I would say Using say okay. something like Scala, that would if you're coming from an object-oriented background, you can still program in the object-oriented way. But in that case, you would lose some of the benefits you would have from Scala and Akka. Erlang, okay. in this sense, is, is much stricter and forces you to fit in. But at the same time, you get uh, you, you can it can be much much safer in using these in the, using the, the Erlang features. Yeah, uh, I I think uh, Robert is right, and I would like to add to this that. ACA is, is, is a rewrite of OTP using the same principles, the same notions um, as, as there is in, in OTP in Erlang. Uh, there, so if, if you have to be on the JVM, that if, it, if that's a business requirement for you, then ACA is probably your best choice to do some uh, good, uh, reliable, fault-tolerant systems uh, there. But if, if that's not the key requirement, then you have to keep in mind that um, Scala and Akka, they come out of a school that is a bit more verbose in the way you write code. So you end up writing a lot more lines of code uh, there. And that's actually something when it comes to come maintenance time, which is for most su uh, systems, unless they fail utterly, is 80% of the time. So you have a lot less code still uh, when you're writing Erlang. And that's actually a key point to keeping your engineers happy in the long run that they don't have tons of code that they, they can't uh, find their way through uh, there. So, so Erlang is more to the point uh, there. And uh, if you're not forced to be on the JVM, I would go for Erlang uh, in those situations. OK, well, uh, thank you for that. Uh, and I'm sure you will all join me in thanking Torben and Robert for a very inspiring talk on learning Erlang. As we have all just heard, learning Erlang can be done quickly and efficiently. If your organization is interested in training uh, you and your colleagues in Erlang, do let us know. We will work with you to create a tailored introductory or an advanced level Erlang training course that will last for one working week. As mentioned, um, we can accommodate a minimal class size of five students and a maximum class size of 12 to ensure optimal quality of the learning experience. We can, of course, organize concurrent classes if you have more prospective students wishing to take the course. Again, feel free to contact us on webinar at erlang-solutions.com or my own email address, and we can discuss this more specifically in relation to your unique learning requirements. Many thanks to all of you who have joined us for this webinar. Please join us again end of May for our next webinar, which will be dealing with OpenFlow and our work in this emerging area. You will have a chance to hear about the developments to date and the work we have been doing in developing our own implementation of the OpenFlow switch. On that occasion, we will have Stuart Bailey, the founder and CTO at Infoblox, uh, joining us to tell you about Infoblox's experience in the OpenFlow arena. We will also be sending you a short survey to make sure we capture your feedback of today's webinar. Please note that the presentations that were shared today will also be available for you to collect on Erlang Solutions' corporate website at www.erlang-solutions.com. Thank you once again, and we look forward to seeing you again on our next webinar.